I'm delighted to introduce today's commencement speaker, Mary Nichols. Mary Nichols currently serves as the chairman of the California Air Resources Board, a post she has held since 2007 and also from 1979 to 1983. Talk about repeating yourself. <laughs> The Air Resources Board works with the business sector, the public, and local governments to reduce air pollution and fight climate change with an overall mission to promote and protect public health. As chair of the Air Resources Board, Mary has led the effort to implement Assembly Bill 32, California's landmark legislation to reduce greenhouse gases. As part of her strategy to carry out the legislation, the Air Resources Board designed and implemented the world's most comprehensive cap and trade program to limit greenhouse gas emissions. Mary also oversees a variety of other efforts to improve California's air quality. She has put in place innovative rules and regulations to cut emissions and drive investment in cleaner, more efficient technologies that benefit California. She was instrumental in leading California's joint effort with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and the Federal Department of Transportation to develop historic greenhouse gas emission and fuel economy standards for passenger vehicles. In recent years, she has also overseen the adoption of California's diesel truck rules, delivering major public health and clean air benefits for Southern California and beyond. And I just wanted to say, Michael Blaskin, class of 63, one of the members of our board, asked me to personally thank uh, Mary Nichols, because when he was a student here at Harvey Mudd, they could never see Mount Baldy. <laughs> and now, as you know, we can see Mount Baldy almost every day. Mary has to... Mary has devoted her entire career to advocating for the environment and public health. After graduating from Cornell University and Yale Law School, she practiced environmental law in Los Angeles where she argued cases on behalf of environmental and public health organizations to enforce state and federal clean air legislation. President Clinton appointed her to head the Office of Air and Radiation at the US EPA in Washington for from 1993 to 97. She oversaw many regulatory breakthroughs, including the acid rain trading program and the first air quality standard regulating fine particles. Mary also served as California's Secretary for Natural Resources from 1999 to 2003. Prior to her return to the Air Resources Board, she was professor of law and director of the Institute of the Environment at UCLA. The Los Angeles Times has called her an environmental rock star. Yes. CBS News dubbed her the Queen of Green. And she was recognized in 2013 as one of Time's 100 most influential people in the world. Please join me in welcoming Mary Nichols. Thank you so much, President Clawey, for that amazing uh, introduction. And uh, I want to also uh, extend my special greetings to the faculty and the administration, parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles, cousins and friends, esteemed guests, protesters, of who there were a few outside uh, the gate there, and uh, most of all, to the graduates. Before I even attempt to go on, however, I want to say that it's actually rather unfair to a guest speaker to invite them to follow your student speaker. <laughs> Cindy, that was amazing, and I'd like to give you another round of applause. I, I say that because no one can possibly capture the special essence of what it means to have been a student here uh, in quite such a, a wonderful and uh, really uh, broad way, and so I'm going to not even attempt to do anything like that. But I do want to say that I'm especially pleased to have been asked to come and speak here today 
because I do represent what, by many accounts nowadays, is considered to be one of, if not the world's most successful uh, environmental programs. And in some ways, even more uh, relevant to my being here today is the fact that there has been so much work done on this campus to uh, improve diversity, to improve the engagement with the community, and these issues of environmental equity and environmental justice are the tasks that all of us are going to be uh, dealing with in our uh, careers and our lives to come. Your president, President Clave, is a recognized leader among academics and scientists in this critical movement, and we're beginning to see the results, so thank you uh, for all of that. I also speak to you as a member of an underrepresented group on this campus, uh, namely people who washed out of calculus in high school. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> I thought that would get more of a response. Um, <laughs> Apparently not. Um, I graduated with honors in Russian literature and awards in creative writing, but when years later my father, who was a professor of electrical engineering at Cornell, found out that I had been selected for a job that had something to do with setting air pollution standards for automobiles, he was completely flabbergasted. Now, I tell this in part because those of you who are graduating today with your marvelous educations in science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and the job opportunities that I know are waiting for you out there, we know that your fate, as well as the fate of the planet, are in the hands of people like me, who have none of those advantages, uh, and others who will get to uh, be part of the decision making as well. You've worked hard to get here today, and you deserve to get a little bit of a break and kick back, but not for too long, because I'm here to tell you that there's a lot more to be done, and we need you to help do it. As you all know, our planet is already experiencing major climatic shifts that are affecting our weather, precipitation patterns, as well as the health and the survival of communities all over the world. We need to immediately and significantly change the way we generate and use energy and the ways we manage our built and natural environments. In California, despite decades of tremendous progress, many of our cities and counties still rank as the most polluted in the country. In much of the state, including here in Southern California, we may have to cut pollution another 90% below recent levels over about 15 years just in order to comply with federal health standards set under the Clean Air Act. For some, including many people in my generation, the scale of these problems staggers the imagination. But for some of us, and I hope for most of you, it fires us up. Over the next 50 years, that is the duration of the working lives of the people who are graduating here today, we must virtually eliminate all sources of air and climate pollution. That's pretty much all. If solutions are going to come from anywhere to problems of these dimensions, they're going to come from graduates of Harvey Budd College. The changes and the choices that will get us there depend on you. The state of California has a pretty good head start. We've adopted goals, reducing our emissions of greenhouse gases to 80%, below 1990 by 2050, which is the level that's required to reduce California's contribution to what is needed according to the best science to prevent a global climate increase of two degrees centigrade. We've capped our emissions and instituted the first economy-wide allowance trading in the world. We are enforcing rules aimed at reducing the carbon content of fuels and increasing the fraction of electricity that's generated by renewable resources, not counting dams or nuclear energy, to 33% by 2020. And we're well on track to reach our interim target of returning our greenhouse gas emissions levels to 1990 by 2020, by which time all of you will be settling into your careers and your grown-up lives. But to get to the longer term goals that will shape the future, not only of California's economy and our iconic landscapes, but the chances of the people of the rest of the world for healthy, secure lives, 
we need to do much more. Governor Brown has expressed this challenge as three fifties. We need to get to 50% renewables in our generating mix. You know, we could do better. We need to reduce our petroleum use by 50%. We need to make all of our existing buildings 50% more efficient. And we've added a few more goals for good measure, including restoring the ability of our forests, farms, and natural lands to store carbon and protecting our cities from the emerging new normal of climate-related emergencies. Now, the parallel with the lives of the students who are graduating here today, I think, is uh, somewhat instructive. By, by 2025, just as you are settling into your working lives and probably having bought your first zero net carbon home, uh, making a contribution through your work to sustainability overall, we need to see at least one and a half million electric and fuel cell cars on California's roads. And global greenhouse gas emissions need to have peaked and started to decline. You will be getting ready to attend your 10th reunion. By the time you're 40, as you begin asking yourself where the time is going, you will have helped to virtually eliminate all air pollution from vehicles in Southern California and will have greenhouse gas emissions below about 40%, below 1980 levels, will have cut our petroleum use in half, uh, will be well on our way. And by the time that you're back here to applaud as parents of a hypothetical child that will be, have graduated from Harvey Mudd, you will have helped to transform the entire economy to one of carbon neutrality and figured out how to do it all in ways that also promote opportunity for all. So it's as simple as that. Save the world, then you can retire. But of course you won't want to because you will be having too much fun working together, creating these solutions, socializing with each other, etc. cetera. Um, now, I only fantasize a little bit because the fact is that science and technology applied without adequate knowledge of the consequences or respect for the interconnectedness of life got us into the scary mess that we're in today, and we're going to have to use them to get us out of it. So that means that people from Harvey Mudd College are going to have to talk to a lot of other folks and educate them, including journalists, politicians, poets, and linguists, and all of us together are going to have to be part of the solution. But I know you're up for the task. You are the graduates of the top-ranked undergraduate engineering program in the country, and so you actually are the rock stars. You are problem solvers. I know that from my daily interactions with scientists and engineers at the Air Resources Board that people who approach life from the perspective that they will find a solution, that there is a solution, that they can figure it out if they pull it apart and take it to the next level, if they don't say it can't be done but say there's a solution, we just have to look at this in a different way, this is what it's going to take to get us through. And this applies regardless of the constraints or the particular problem that you're trying to solve. Now, take the example of being able to see Mount Baldy, which I was happy to uh, be thanked for. Uh, me and a few thousand other people uh, definitely had a lot to do with the fact that we can see Mount Baldy on most days from this campus. Well, the Air Resources Board back in the 1970s had to fight to get to that point. We did have uh, the solutions, or we thought we knew what could be done, but the fact is that the lobbyists and the lawyers, in many cases, for the companies that we were approaching, told us it couldn't be done. But once they got over the legal and political battles and let the scientists and engineers take over, they did find solutions, including, among other things, the three-way catalytic converter, onboard diagnostic systems, better materials, et cetera. And so today, cars that are on the road are 99% cleaner than they were then, and the industry is thriving, and you get to enjoy the view of the mountains from most days on the campus. So we, we have a reason to feel confident that using our brains, as well as making commitments, we can solve problems, and that we can also stabilize our climate. 
But we also know that it's not technology alone that will solve our climate and air quality problems. There's a broad array of strategies out there that can help us. Some of them are indeed technical and complex, such as automated vehicles or offshore wind turbines. Others may be as simple as walking more and eating your vegetables. But what we need to access all of these strategies is a combination of a moral commitment to address the problem and an understanding of how to work effectively in the public and political arena. Harvey Mudd graduates have got that kind of education behind them, and I hope the confidence that you, in fact, are gonna be able to do this, because you're gonna to need to bring with you all that you gained here, your technical expertise, your liberal arts training, as well as your honor code. Yes, that too because we have to believe that if we give people choices to do the right thing on climate change, they will. So my view is we need more mutters in the world helping us to solve all these problems and to lead us with hearts and minds and that we need to uh, be confident in what we can do together and I know you are. So. I'm standing between you and a diploma, which is going to be a recognition of what you've achieved so far, and I hope you're going to take it and uh, use it to help the rest of us as we all move forward together. Thank you very much.